You know, um, growing up, my mom was a huge influence in my life. My sisters were a super huge influence in my life. And um, I've seen my sisters go through a lot. I've seen my mom go through a lot. Well, all three of my sisters are single mothers. So they've all struggled and, and um, I know there's a lot of women out there, especially in our day and age, that are struggling and going through a lot. And I always wanted to find a way to just kind of give back. I think a lot of people in life look for love through other people and, and they reflect that back on themselves. So, and that's not where love comes from. Nobody can make you love yourself. You have to love who you are as a person and find the genuineness within yourself. And it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. It, it took me a very long time to actually love who I was as a person, accept who I was, and not care what people thought about me. Because for the longest time, I would just care about what I was wearing, wearing the nicest shoes, or how I acted. And, and, and over time, I just realized how immature that was. This week on American Real, we kick off our millennial series with Chris GQ Perry, a self-made artist who has built a tremendous social media following with over a million members strong. Chris is a model, a musician, and also a motivational speaker where his main platform is to inspire women, especially single mothers, to give them words of encouragement, inspiration, and hope to become their best selves. I think you'll see Chris in a whole new light today as we sit down for a very candid conversation. We talk about his past, we talk about people that inspired him to do what he does, and uh, we also discussed where he is headed in the future. So sit back, relax, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed having it with him. Uh, if so, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe to our Instagram and YouTube pages and visit our website, AmericanReal.tv. Also, our Masterminds Elite Pass program is now open for enrollment. If you want to join a network of like-minded individuals, uh, check it out. It may be something for you. We have a private Facebook group. We do live weekly Zoom calls to help inspire each other. And now... Without further ado, I bring to you Chris GQ Perry. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks, and today we kick off our millennial series with Chris GQ Perry singer, songwriter, model, and motivational speaker. Chris, welcome to the show. What's going on, man? I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that you guys actually had me. I oh, appreciate I appreciate that. it very much. We've been looking forward to this. And as you know, American Real, we are trying to recognize uh, outstanding millennials right. um, as an ongoing part of our, of our broadcast. And uh, we've been watching you for, for many months uh, and watching all the incredible uh, inspirational videos that, that you're 
putting out there, and we couldn't think of a, of a better representative to kick off our series. That's awesome. That means a lot to me. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, to start off, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your platform and your mission. I would love to know about your background. Okay, well, um, everybody knows Chris C.Q. Perry is my name. Uh, I started doing music. I've been doing it for a while now, but one of the main things that I, my way of giving back to people was always the motivational speeches. And just because, you know, music's a way to give back and you can speak through your music, but I always felt like I wanted to give back a different way. So my way was motivational speeches and being able to just make videos that people can relate to and people can actually understand and feel. Because you never know what somebody's going through. You never know what somebody's struggle is daily. So for me, the importance was to make videos that people can relate to, that people can actually feel and um, kind of like see me as a person and not just a, an artist or as a, as a figure, as somebody that's going through the same struggles or somebody that's experienced the same things. You know, um, growing up, my mom was a huge influence in my life. My sisters were a super huge influence in my life. And um, I've seen my sisters go through a lot. I've seen my mom go through a lot. So I've always, so at, I got to a point where I wanted to relate to, to single mothers. And I want, my mom wasn't a single mother. My dad was always in my life, but my sister's a single mother. And my other sisters are single mothers. Well, all three of my sisters are single mothers. So they've all struggled. And, and um, I know there's a lot of women out there, especially in our day and age, that are struggling right. and going through a lot. And I always wanted to find a way to just kind of give back to those women that needed it. Yeah, and really connect with them, right? Because I notice in your videos, it, when, you, when you speak, it comes from the heart. Right. And, uh, you know, I think people today are trying to be authentic. You know, they want to show that authentic side and I really see that from you. Is that something that you think about? Is that? Absolutely, because at the end of the day, no matter how big or how far I get in my career, I'm still, I'm still human. I'm still the same person. I'm always gonna stay level-headed because as, as soon as I've got it, I can get it taken away the same day. Right. So I'm very appreciative. I, I believe in God, I believe in karma. So all those things are huge factors in my life and they, and they contribute to the person that I am today. That's awesome. Uh, I definitely want to talk about how music inspired you, but before we do that, I'm sure people are curious, I'm curious, how did you get the nickname uh, GQ? Uh, Where did that come from? I love it. The GQ nickname, um, growing up I loved sports. I played football, basketball. When I played football I used to come to practice and I was always like really fresh and clean and one of my football Dressed coaches. Nice. Yeah, he was an Italian guy, deep voice, he was like, Chris, GQ get out here. You know, because I was always so smooth. I had like that GQ approach. Yes. So I kind of got the name from football. Okay. And uh, when I left college and I started doing music, I thought about it and I was like, you know, let me think of a good artist name. And I decided to go with GQ because it just kind of fit. It fits like, you. Yeah. Like yeah. my style and just kind of what I bring and what I offer is, you know, be, represent yourself correctly. Represent yourself with fashion and style, you know, be presentable. Right. So uh, that's a name that kind of just stuck with me. So. Coach Fescio, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. Um, yeah, no, and, and, and again, I think it's important, um, especially for young people today, it is good to be presentable. Right. Um, and a lot of people don't have, um, you know, the role models to, to help tell them if they go into a job interview or, you know, like you said, even go into practice. Right. Always be presentable. Uh, where did you learn that from? Just growing up, I had a really strong foundation in... Um, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I went to Johnson City High School, and um, growing up, I, I really struggled with uh, kind of really bad anxiety hmm. my seventh and eighth grade year, and um, it kind of affected my schooling, and I didn't go to class, and uh, basically, I had no chance of graduating high school. I didn't think I was going to graduate. My parents didn't think I would. So, um, What type of anxiety, if you don't mind me asking? Just kind of like... Um, I was really a shy person and I didn't really talk to people. Mm. I, I got like anxiety around a lot of people and um, it kind of put me in a weird place. So my father made it in public schools didn't help because they weren't giving me that foundation that I needed. Uh, so my dad decided to put me in a Catholic school. So I, got, I went to Seton Catholic. Okay. And going to Seton, it kind of was more structured. You know, you couldn't leave for lunch. You couldn't- you Have to couldn't wear a tie. Yeah. And, um, the, the coaches and just playing football. My dad was a coach at the school and, you know, he, he really helped me to stay in, in, in the school and uh, focus on being a successful person. So it kind of just changed everything and it made me, made me the man that I am today. I was just going to say that set the foundation for today, right? Yes. Seton Catholic were. Central High School. <laughs> that's, that's, 
So let's talk about your music. How did that begin? How old were you? When did you really get involved with it to a point where you said, hmm, I think I want to do this as a career? I, I love music since eighth, ninth grade. I was writing poetry. That's actually what I started with was um, poetry. And uh, I was just writing for fun in class when I, whenever I got bored or whenever I didn't want to pay attention. <laughs> so um, after a while, I, I got a few pub uh, poems that were published. And once my poems got published, I, you know, I was like, wow, you know, I, I actually started to believe in myself and believe that I had some talent. And I transitioned that into music because I always loved music and I loved beats and harmonies. And so I took my poems and I, and I turned them into to music. And I started with the whole rap thing and I wasn't really doing the singing thing at the time. And then it kept growing on me and I just couldn't stop doing it. And all through college, even when I was focused on my, my major in school, you know, I. I I just always found myself in my free time making music, writing poems, and I was just like, this is something that I love. So am I gonna spend the rest of my life doing something that I'm supposed to do because I gotta follow the steps? Or am I gonna spend the rest of my life doing something that I love and that I enjoy doing? And I came to the conclusion that, you know, after college, I could have just went straight into my career, but no, I took a step back and I decided to follow my dreams and, you know, see where it would take me. And that's kind of like, my lifeline right now, that's something in my life that's very important It's something that I cherish and I really believe in myself. And now other people are starting to believe in, in me and that means a lot to me. But it starts there, right? Uh, believing in yourself yes, and having that self-love, right? To, to, to love yourself first before you could really love others. Right. Are you, are you seeing that? Are you feeling that in your life? You, you have to love yourself first because if you don't love yourself, then how do you expect somebody else to love you? you um, and like, for people that are struggling, can you, can you talk about that a little deeper? How do you get there? I think a lot of people in life look for love through other people and, and they reflect that back on themselves. So, and that's not where love comes from. Nobody can make you love yourself. You have to love who you are as a person and find the genuineness within yourself. And it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. It, it took me a very long time to actually love who I was as a person, accept who I was, and not care what people thought about me. Because for the longest time, I would just care about what I was wearing, wearing the nicest shoes, or how I acted. And, and, and over time, I just realized how immature that was, or how, how much, you know, and, and then those people that I wanted to love me, the, the moment that they didn't love me, I started to hate myself. And I was like, why would I hate myself? Because other people don't like me. Yeah. You know, I have to love myself regardless. And um, over time, I learned to love myself. And I know no matter where I'm at in my life, no matter what's going on or whatever the situation is, I always have that self-confidence and that, that love within myself. Wonderful. Let's talk about poetry a little bit. Um, we have that in common. I, I loved to write poetry when I was in high school. Uh, my teacher you know, noticed it. And um, I never really told anyone because I just thought it was a, little, a bit different. Right. Um, but I used, to, you know, I used to write poetry. Uh, awesome. When I got married, um, I wrote a nice poem for my wife, and that was presented uh, in the church, you know, before mass. And, and um, should have brought it today. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely post it. But um, I'm interested how you became interested in poetry, and how that transitioned into music. Um, like I said, with my anxiety, that was kind of my stress reliever. Aside from sports. It kind of just put me in a, in a good place, you know, whenever the world was against me, I felt like everything was just closing in. Because I don't think, when I say I had anxiety, it was extremely bad anxiety. <laughs> to the point where I, I, I just felt like I couldn't breathe, or I just felt like really closed in. And I felt like, just very not, not in a good place. So for me, poetry really just brought me into my own world. It was your outlet? Yes, it was my outlet. It was something that really just brought me in a, in a positive space. Mm -hmm. And once I started to write, you know, I kind of just built like a talent for it, and I think I had a natural talent as well. And was it um, up the rhythm? Did you were you were you working with the rhymes, the rhythm? Um, would you pick a topic? How did you get into a particular poem? Um, poetry itself didn't start with the music or the harmonies or the beats or anything. It just kind of started just writing. Right. And then. Um, I would listen to some of my favorite rappers at the time, and I was just like, man, that's so cool how they do that. I want to do that. So that influenced you? That influenced me. And uh, one, of my favorite, one of my biggest inspirations at that point in time was uh, Nas. Like, I love Nas, and uh, 
he did a song called One Mic. You know, when I heard that, like I did a remix to it, and it was just, it was just cool how he came up with concepts and, and put his poetry into music. And I kind of just how, that's how I transitioned, was just listening to rappers like that. And then I got into the whole R&B pop thing later on. You, I, I believe, I would consider you a social media sensation, really, because you've built up a tremendous following. Um, and, you know, you're an inspiration. I've been watching your videos. Uh, it's very inspiring, and I could see how it would be inspiring for young people, especially young women, uh, right. who you mentioned that, um, you know, you're, you, you connect with, you know, because of your mom and your sisters, and I, and I think that's wonderful. Um, but what, what inspires you to produce these type of videos? Um, just personal experiences. And one of the biggest personal, for instance, there was a time where, um, and I said this story on my social media, and uh, there was a time I met this woman at uh, the grocery store. And she was arguing with her man, and he was calling her all types of names. She was a little bit bigger woman, and he was just extremely like disrespectful and just rude to her, and he ended up just leaving her. And she ended up just having to stay behind. She didn't have anywhere to go because he left her with the car. And um, I ended up giving her a ride home, and we just had conversation, and we talked, and that was like a very touching moment for me. But there was, very, there was times in my life when I saw my sisters go through things, and I'd be like, you know, it was just very hard for me to see that growing up, being young, and um, seeing how many women are just hurt and in bad positions and kind of changed because of what, what men have done to them and how they, they get stuck with the kids. Because if you think about it in a relationship, there's a man and a woman, they have a kid together, who gets stuck with the kid? The, the woman. It's, it's the mom. She, sure. has to, she has to, all the responsibilities go on her if he decides he doesn't want to be around. It's hard for me or it's hard for somebody without kids to live life, right. to get a job and not struggle. A woman with kids, it's 10 times harder because she's not just worrying about herself at that point in time. She's worrying about her kids. That's right. And the struggle becomes intensified times 10. So how could you not respect those women? Those women are young queens. You gotta, you gotta love them on a different level. You gotta respect them on a different level. And that's how I feel. And, and that's why I wanna give back because there might be that day when she's going through something and she needs those words to encourage her to get through her day. And if I have a platform and I've created a platform for myself, why would I not give back? And why would I not give back to somebody that I actually can, can relate to and like kind of feel for? Right. So that's why I do what I do. Because at the end of the day, it's all, of, it's all about giving back. You know, I can do what I want to do and I'm, I get so much love and appreciation and support. How selfish would I be to just not give back, you know? And tell us about, uh, you must receive hundreds if not thousands of messages uh, right. from, from your followers. What are some of the things that you hear that, that touches your heart that says, you know what, I'm, I'm doing the right thing here? What are some of the daily, I mean, are you, are you hearing from women saying, you know, obviously, thank you, but yes. do you have any examples? Um, a lot of appreciation, a lot of, a lot of thank yous, like you said. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just say messages along those lines. Um, a lot of girls ask me for advice, and that's why I do my Q and A's on usually like a Saturday or Sunday, yes. because that's my way, you know, to to give back. Because I obviously can't answer every message in my inbox. Right. But it's just a lot of appreciation, and and um, that means a lot to me too. That kind of gives me the ambition to keep going. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're they're showing love and they want to, you know, they're they're actually listening to the messages I'm delivering. So. Right. Right. So, what are your thoughts? about dating for your generation? Our generation is kind of messed up <laughs> in a sense where it's just everything is just so fast paced. And I think that's just our, our social media, for instance. You, watch, you can watch a video of somebody dying on social media and that video gets forgot about in 15 to 20 minutes because it's on to the next video. And that just relates to everything in life, not just videos, not just that type of thing, like dating. You could be talking to somebody on social media for one week, things don't go well, you give up easily, and you're on to the next person. Because it's so easy to reach out to different people, you know, they always say there's a lot of fish in the sea, there's always more fish in the sea. And that is really magnified to the fullest extent now because there really is. Because you could talk to somebody in Florida, you could talk to somebody in California, across the country, within a click of a button. And um, I think people have lost the, the idea of substance and the idea of real love and being genuine because it's so easy to reach out to other people and, and everything is done through text, you know, 
barely, I've, I've talked to females that don't even pick up the phone, you know, they want to text the whole time. And that personal connection is, is lost. And right? that personal connection is diminished completely. Yeah. And it's all through text and it's just kind of, um, it's hard to build that connection because if I, was to, if I was to go on a date, if I was to hang out with a girl and we hung out every day and it was me and her in a room every day, we're going to build a connection, we're going to build a sense of love for each other. If I'm texting her and we're just talking through social media, we just have a social media connection. That's not going to last. That's not real. That's not strong. So I feel like our generation is so quick to move on and so quick to give up and so quick to say, forget this person for whatever reason that we lost that, that, um, that, that idea to work on things. Right. You know, in a relationship, when things go wrong, you don't just leave someone. You work on that. You try to build from that, you know, because everything's not going to be perfect in a relationship. People are going to mess up. People are going to make mistakes. It's, the communication is a huge factor. You have to be able to work through things and build to become a better person. Because if you just keep quitting on people in relationships and keep stopping talking to that person, I bet you you're going to be lonely because you didn't talk to so many people and you just That's kept right. cutting them off for the simplest reasons. And you never took that time to put your pride to the side, put your insecurities to the side and say, okay, I'm going to work on these things. And uh, we're going to work on these things and we're going to grow together. And I feel like that's more of an old school generation thing. And, and people kind of laugh at it now. But um, I think it takes a real man and a real woman to understand and to work on things. Right. Speaking of dating, uh, what would be your example of an ideal date? If someone, if a girl is going to go on a date with Chris Perry, right. how would it happen? My ideal date would have to be something that I'm old school. I mean, I'm young, but I'm old school. So I would have to. I grew up listening to the 90s, 80s R&B music. So the idea of just, if you're really interested in a girl and you're taking her on a date, if I'm interested in a girl and I'm taking her on a date, I wanna do it the right way. You know, we, I wanna plan something out for her for that day. I wanna be able to pick her up at a certain time, open the door for her like a gentleman, pull her seats out for her, and um, surprise her throughout the date. I don't want it to be a simple dinner in, in movies. And if we do do dinner, I want to take her to a spot that's, that's unique, not necessarily fancy or expensive in a sense, but something that's unique and something that she's going to remember. Maybe something with like live concert, you know, something that she enjoys. Because at the end of the day, before I take her out, I want to know the things that she likes. And I can incorporate that into a date because even if that's the only date that we go on, she'll never forget that. And she'll always remember those moments. So you just got to make her feel special, make her feel like you actually put time and effort and energy into that date. And, um, just create memories. Yeah. Uh, when you think about the future of, of a relationship, do you see that continuing? Because I know a lot of guys that, you know, that happens in the beginning, you know, and things are great. Um, but then over time, a lot of men, you know, just kind of forget about those little things. How important is it to continue on with all those small but large examples that, that you just described? I think it's extremely important. I also think you need to switch it up because if you can't keep doing the same thing over and over and over again because it gets old and it gets boring. We as humans, we get bored. You know, we, we want different things in our life. We want spice in our life. And that's why I say in a relationship, always spice up the relationship. If you keep it the same the whole time, you're going to get bored. And eventually it's going to get to a point in a relationship where you're going to decide, is this what I really want? And if this is really what you want, like I said, working on things, you're going to switch some things up. You're going to communicate with one another to find things that bring that spice back into the relationship when you guys first started talking. Yeah. So the big question is, are you single? Yes, I am you single. And, the re and a lot of people say, why are you single? Yeah, that was my next question. Uh, when you're, I'm so focused on my career and who I want to be. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, saying, it's, I'm not saying I'm opposed to a relationship right now, but it's very hard for me to find somebody that I can actually be with because I'm so focused on my career, and I would hate to give a woman half of me. Because as much as I preach about giving a woman all of you and being 100%, I would never want to be that hypocrite right. and, and only be able to give her half of my love or half of me as a person. So I just feel like at this point in my life, I'm not ready for that. And, um, I think that's very mature on your part, actually. Yes, and I, and I try to be, and I'm not saying I'm a, I've dated, I've talked to girls, but at the same sense, in the back of my mind, I always knew that, you know, I can't give you what you need right now. And um, a lot of, 
certain people will understand that and certain people won't. Mm -hmm. Because it'll be like, you know, you always need somebody by your side to, to help you get to the next level. And I agree to an extent. But um, to build that foundation to where you can have that person by your side is kind of, I'm at a sticky point in my life where I really want to, I want to make it. I want to be successful. I want to take it to the next level. And for me to do that, I need to focus. Like, yeah. I need to. And I can't have any distractions. And that really goes back to that self-love we talked about earlier, too, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think self-love encompasses a lot of things, including, um, you know, making sure that you're comfortable in not only yourself day to day, but your career, yeah. um, you know, before you are ready to, to take on that commitment, um, you know, of a significant other. Right. A hundred percent. So, Chris, tell us, uh, have you had any childhood experiences that made you become the person you are? Anything that happened that uh, um, you might want to reflect on? Well, growing up, um, I wasn't necessarily in the best crowd. Um, a lot of my friends were caught up in the wrong lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, the gang affiliations and stuff like that. And one of my best friends, who was an extremely talented kid, I'll never forget, we were in middle school, and he was always in the advanced classes. <laughs> I was always in the regular classes. Um, his name was Rakeem, um, black kid, my best friend. And uh, he was always in the advanced classes. I'm like, how the hell did he get in all the advanced classes? Always. But he was always caught up in the wrong lifestyle. He was always caught up in the, in the, in the gang violence. And, and he, that's just something about that intrigued him in his life. And uh, as we got older, in our early 20s, um, he got caught up in a couple situations and he actually almost got killed in two different situations. He got stabbed uh, eight, nine times, wow. shot five, and these are two different scenarios and he ended up surviving both of those. And um, this is when he came back home after he, he, he left college, he dropped out of college, he came home and um, these incidents happened and you know, um, it just kind of made me, it gave me a reflection because when he got shot, I was there for that experience. And um, I was one of the- You were with him? Yes and the bullets literally flew right by me. And I'm watching my best friend get shot. I thought it was, I didn't even think it was a real gun. I thought it was a, was a, a BB gun because of the way it happened. And when I, when I looked at him, when I got him off the floor, you couldn't see the bullets. You know, they were, it was like a smaller gun, like a 22 or something. And I picked him up and I was just like, you know, he wasn't talking, he wasn't responsive. Um, we put him in a car and we, we took him to the hospital. And at that moment, I thought, like, you know, I lost my best friend. I lost somebody that was close to me growing up. And I'll never forget, I, I'll never forget the way I met him. Uh, I was playing basketball at CFJ Park with my uncle and my dad. Uh, we were playing basketball, and this kid comes over with his, his, he had some basketball trunks on it, some Tims. And he goes, yo, what's up, man? Why are you playing on my court? <laughs> so, you know, we're playing on the court and he was literally trying to fight me. This is before I knew who he was. And we almost got to a fist fight. My uncle ended up stopping the fight. And then literally the next day, you know, we were going to the same school in Johnson City, Johnson City Middle School. Uh, we became friends. Uh, we lived two different lifestyles because I didn't come from that life. And uh, we ended up just growing a relationship. But back to what I was saying, just seeing him go through so much and having to carry my best friend and almost losing him was like an eye-opener for me. I'm sure, and I, I could only imagine what it would have been like being in that position, uh, thinking of your own safety. Um, what was your state of mind? I mean, were you, were you emotional? Were you crying? I mean, what, go back to that day. Tell us, tell us how uh, you felt. I was just, I was in shock. Um, afterwards, like it really hit me, but when it happened, I was just, I wanted to make sure that he was okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just a real tough situation for me, but it was a real eye opener because my dad always told me growing up, you know, don't get caught up in the wrong crowd. Cause he came, my dad came from a rough life. He's from Tennessee. And, um, you know, growing up, I used to always see my dad shave and he would always have his shirt off. He had all these like war wounds on his chest, like scars everywhere. And I'd be like, yo dad, how'd you get those? He'd be like, don't worry about it, son. You know, he, he never wanted to tell me. He never wanted me to see that side of things. But later on, my mom told me that uh, a lot of that was gang related, my dad was caught up in the wrong stuff growing up. And all the things that he told me growing up that I needed to not be a part of, I didn't, I just thought he was just, I didn't know that it was from personal experience and the things that he's been through, that he was just being a great dad and trying to tell me like, son, I don't, want you. You to, I don't want you to go on the same path. I don't right. want to see you go through this. 
the same things I had to go through because the outcome is, is never good. And um, he ended up leaving that whole lifestyle behind when he came to Binghamton. He joined the army and the military. My dad is a, I'm mixed, I'm black and white. If you didn't know, my dad is a tall black man and um, him coming from nothing, poverty. Um, going to Tennessee, first time I went to Tennessee to visit his family, my uncle tried to kill my nephew with a shotgun. <laughs> like it was insane, but wow. it was literally like something that you see out of like a a Big Mama movie or something, like a comedy scene, but it was insane. And, and just seeing the struggle that he's come from and the things that he's been through to become such a respectable man in the army and be a, a stand-up guy and a, one of the biggest recruiters in the area. And, and being a black man from this area and doing these kind of things, he had to face a lot of controversy. There's a lot of things, you know, people didn't want to see my dad succeed, but he had a family to take care of. He had, you know, my sisters, you know, it, it was just really tough for him, but I, and I look up to him. My dad's always been in my life. He's always been a father figure. He, and um, to me, you know, to see a black man, a strong black man, take on the responsibility of being there for his kids and, and, and making sure that they follow the right path. And that just meant a lot to me. And um, just killed the, the stereotypical thing where black men never stick around right. and take care of the kids. So to this day, you know, my dad's always been like a real quiet kind of guy. He's, he's never really talked to me about a lot. Um, and I kind of just, that's like something I need to work on. I want to build that relationship with my dad. But regardless of everything, he's always, he's always been there. You must be proud of him. I'm, I'm so proud of my dad and just the man that he is. And um, I'm hoping I could be at least half the man that he is and uh, give back and, and, and be successful. But back to what I was saying about the whole Rakeem situation, it's just, you know, I've, I've seen a lot growing up. Um, I've seen the worst of the worst. And I, I don't ever want my kids to go through that. I don't ever want to be a part of that lifestyle. Again, I want to be successful. I want to follow the right path. I want to be a positive influence. What would you say to the young men out there and younger than you, maybe going back, say, 10 years or, or even more, um, what advice do you have for them? That people get so caught up in being cool. People get so caught up in that lifestyle of the hood lifestyle, the gangster lifestyle that they don't realize that they're just hurting themselves in the long run because that's going to only lead to two things. It's going to lead to death or it's going to lead to jail. Which road do you want to take? Because that's, that's where you're headed. And um, I just, I say when you're young, you know, it's, it's, it's so hard because there's so many influences and there's so much peer pressure. Right. But you have to have positive, you have to have positive influences in your life, people in your life that are pushing you in the right direction. Because honestly, if you don't have that, it's very hard to be self-motivated and do it by yourself. So, but my suggestion is follow your dreams, have something that you love to do and, and, and chase that. Don't get distracted because these little things don't matter. It's all about the bigger picture. And a lot, you know, I can't, a lot of people don't learn that till later in their life. Yeah. So it's hard for me to even preach that to a younger crowd. I can preach it till I'm blue in the face. But a lot of it's just self-experience and just learning, through your, learning from experiences. Right, yeah. And going back to the situation with your friend, I mean, you, you, you nearly witnessed death. Yeah. Um, that had to really make a big impact on you. Mm -hmm. uh, you said it did. Um, how's your friend doing today? He's doing good. He actually moved down to um, South Carolina. Okay. He's got a beautiful daughter. Great. He's got his son. Oh, great. And he's got his mind on straight. He's working on electrical, his electrical um, license and all that stuff so he can be an engineer. Great. I mean, um, What's it called? Electrician? Electrician. Yes. Yeah, no, that's a good career. So he's focused on his career and um, it's just, it's good to see him in a different place. But he's got a lot of demons that he had to face during that time. It's just being able to, I think PTS, post-traumatic stress, the things that he's been through, a lot of people, you know, that takes a, that takes a toll on you mentally. But I think he's in a great place now. I think God has a bigger purpose for him. There's a reason he's alive through all the situations that he's been through. And um, I think he's working on finding that reason and becoming that man that, that God wants him to be, in a sense. That's great. Um, yeah, and you say uh, post-traumatic stress. A lot of people think of that only, you know, being in the military. Right. But that could happen in, in gang life, right? It, it could happen in the streets. It can happen, it happen anywhere. Streets, any any yeah. type of 
serious situation that happens in your life or a traumatic situation. So Chris, uh, do you feel as if women in some ways today are more like men? I think women have harder exteriors and harder shells nowadays, but I feel like sometimes they're shifting it in the wrong direction. Um, women are fed up with, with guys that are not being serious and taking them serious and, and playing games with them. And I think it's to a point where they're getting this hard exterior and they're trying to create the role of almost the role that the men have for themselves and trying to play the man role. And if you notice, most women nowadays are the head of the household. The stay at home men, like stay at home There's dad. There's a shift, right? Yeah, and it's like, it, it's a complete shift. Yeah. And women are taking on the role of, of that men have taken on in the past. And there's nothing wrong with a woman being ambitious and going out and getting herself, because I respect that 100%. But um, I, just, I just feel like the whole women having multiple, talking to multiple dudes or having multiple dudes, side pieces. Um, I, I, I don't really respect it in a sense. Um, so just for the older generation, like even my generation, so I'm probably 20 years older than you, thereabouts, right. it's a bit foreign. And, and it may be to a lot of people watching this. So what, what do you mean? So you're saying women play a role yes. where uh, they're talking to multiple men? Where we, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the role is, okay. The roles are in reverse. Thank you for the sense. education. Okay, so I, I, I don't want to use the N-word, but the side, side piece, like side dude, side chick. Yes. And um, the women don't have their main guy and then their side chick. Okay. A side dude. Okay. Maybe side chick. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who true. knows? Right. But uh, it's, it's like a trend now. No kidding. It's a trend for guys too. Main piece, side piece. Okay. And um, I just feel like if you're with somebody in a committed relationship, why do you, why yeah. do you have a side piece? There's right. no need for that. So is this secretive? I mean, is this... Uh, oh, no. It's out in the open. Everybody's talking about it. It's, it's become like a cool like the thing. Trendy. Yes. It's a trend. Yeah. And um, I just feel like... Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say women need to be this way or that way because they don't. I, I think it's very awesome that women are going out and getting on their own. That we have successful women that are owning businesses and just in general just doing what they have to do to be successful. But I feel like it should be a partnership. It should be 50-50. A man should be working, a woman should be working, and they're reaching goals. It shouldn't be all falling into one person's lap. Do you feel there's a maturity stage though where you know, whether it's the man or the woman, they may not be ready for that, or they find excitement in this lifestyle of having, you know, multiple partners. I mean, what, what I, is it? I think that there's definitely a level where, there's a point where a girl gets mature and she changes and decides she doesn't want these things. But what are we installing in our kids at a young age? Mm -hmm. If at 21, 20, we're telling kids it's okay to have side pieces and main pieces, and when they grow up, you know, by the time they get to that age where they're ready to settle down and they're mature, they, they already have four or five kids. Uh, they're already in a, a really messed up predic predicament. Yeah. So what are we teaching our young kids? I have a niece, my niece Kendra, she's 12. You know, I don't want to see her have multiple dudes in her life. Um, I want to be a man and a positive figure in her life to where she doesn't need that or where she could see how a man is supposed to treat her. And she won't expect anything less because if she knows that my uncle always treats me great. He's a good guy in my life. When I meet a man, I want that man to treat me the same way. I want him to show me the same love and respect. And if she knows that, she'll never settle for less. But if she never has that figure in her life, which she has my, she has my dad too, and she has her dad that's there when he wants to be. But I want to always be that positive figure that's consistently in her life. And it's consistently going to be there for her and show her this is what I, this is the type of man I want in my life. This kind of guy. Right. You know what I mean? Yes. And she won't, she won't accept a man that's just going to give her part time or right. be there when he wants to be or res respect her when he wants to or not respect her at all. Right. What do you say to young girls, high school girls, who are just coming into their own, um, you know, have the influence of males, uh, um, you know, in their life and now with, 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 uh, the social media and the phones and FaceTime and you know I have a 15 year old daughter 
Right. So, um, you know, we try very hard to monitor her activity, but look, at the same time, you can't, you can't be helicopter parents, right? Absolutely. And you, you need to let people uh, learn and, and become, become their own person. But uh, what do you say to young girls who just, you know, they just don't know what to do yet? You know, they don't have the, the confidence. Um, it's, we can't shelter our kids. We can't not expose them to certain things. Um, they're going to do what they want to do. That's right. They're going to find a way to do it. And our role in their life is to let them know that they always have somebody that they can turn to. They always have somebody that's going to be there to listen, somebody that's going to be there to support them. And my thing would always be keeping it honest and keeping it real with them. Because, for instance, me growing up, my mom and my dad sheltered me from certain things. Hmm. You know, they never taught me about sex. They never taught me about the relationship side of things. I kind of had to learn that on my own and learn that from my buddies. So, Which I think happens in most households, right? Yes, and I think, but I think it's crucial to teach your kids about certain things, even if, because a lot of times parents feel like it's uncomfortable for them. But I'd rather have a conversation that's uncomfortable for me that's gonna help my kids have the knowledge they need or help them feel comfortable knowing that they can come talk to me about these things. Anytime, right? No matter At, what. Anytime. And if yes. they feel that and they feel strong and they know they have that foundation, then it won't be an issue as much. They're still going to go do their own thing because, right. you know, teenagers are teenagers when they get to that age. But you have to be able to have that foundation at home and that, and that trust and that communication where they feel comfortable talking to you. Yeah. You talked about sports a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. uh, being an influence on your life. How much so? Um, did you play right through your, your senior year of, of, of high school? Uh, yeah, I played all the way into college football. Oh, you did? Um, football was my main thing, and then I did track. Uh, a little bit of basketball. Obviously, I'm not the tallest guy. <laughs> but uh, football was uh, a huge influence in my life. Um, Barry Sanders and Emma Smith, some of oh, my yeah. favorite players. That's why I'm a Cowboys fan. Okay. Um, Emma Smith and Emma. Deion Sanders and Troy Aikman. Fun days. Yeah, man. It's just, it's just watching those guys. It's, it's just I was always in wow, and that's what made me a Cowboys fan. And uh, I went. In, I played Alfred State, and actually one of my good buddies, Rod Streeter, went off went on to play in the NFL. Really? And um, I ended up drifting and doing other things, but it's always kept me out of trouble, and that's why I think it's it's, it's important for you know kids to get into sports or get into an activity that they like to do because it'll keep you focused in a sense. Yeah. How about today? Are you a fan? Um, uh, of, of the sports? Cowboys? Oh, of the Cowboys and yeah. the sports in general. Still a Cowboys fan, and um, I'm still extremely like athletic. I uh, go to the gym probably four or five times a week. I'm working on my personal training license right now. That's you. something that I, that I love to do. And uh, once again, help other people get their bodies right, get in shape. And uh, that's just a huge factor in my life. How about diet? Are you conscious of your diet? I didn't used to be. I used to eat Burger King almost every day. Okay. <laughs> I, now you're getting a little bit older, right? So you're it's, learning. It's starting to hit. Yeah, it's, it's catching on a little quicker now. Um, I eat a lot better now. I've been watching because of me becoming a personal trainer, I feel like it was, in doing that as a you know, side job or whatever, it's important for me to watch my diet. Yeah. So I've been very crucial on my diet now. And um, I, I've actually seen better results. They say that you know, most of your outer appearance is what you're eating and what you're consuming. And uh, my diet's been pretty fairly good. I still have my cheat days. I can't I can't cut my chicken wings out of my diet. That's know? right. Barbecue chicken wings, hot hot wings. <laughs> That's okay. That's yeah. okay. My wife and I. You mentioned Burger King, so my wife and I, um, uh, we take every Cinco de Mayo, and have that as our Burger King day. So that's oh. our one day a year where we could cheat. We go to Burger King, we have the chicken Only sandwich. one day a year, man. One day a year, so Dude, it's taken impressive. a lot. That's <laughs> impressive. Yeah. But, um, you know, diet is, is, is really important as you're seeing and now, and now you know, living it. Right. Um, and, I, and I think for young people, just to have awareness of that. So it's okay to go to Burger King, McDonald's, um, you know, especially when you're young. But just to be conscious that, you know, over the long term, I think it has really you know, bad ramifications uh, on your body. And, and why not do things proactively to help, you know, your, 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 your mind and body because your diet does affect your mind. Right. 
Absolutely, and even me eating healthy. Um, I used to be a really night per- like a night person. I used to love staying up all night, and I would just sleep in all day well, until I had to do something. But now, me eating correctly, it's really just changed up my lifestyle. It's given me an energy I've never had before, and I kind of live like the old man now. <laughs> like I go to, I can go to bed at, if I didn't have things to do. I can go to bed at ten o'clock and wake up at six, seven in the morning. And that's just because I feel like my lifestyle of eating and, and um, living a healthier lifestyle has kind of changed those things up for me. And sleep is equally as important, right? Seven, eight hours of sleep a day, yeah. you got to get that. Unfortunately, my lifestyle and me just grinding so much, it, it gets tough. Mm-hmm. And there's days when I, I don't get my seven, eight hours of sleep, but I try my best. Yeah. So personal training, tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, you, you're interested in actually training people? Yes, I, I want to get into training all different types of people. Okay. Um, I don't have like a certain category. How about people. someone like me? Can you can you train me? Absolutely, man. I would love to. Uh, it's for me. It's just seeing other people happy and yes. confident within themselves. So um, whatever you know, when I get to that, I, I have to do a couple more tests. It's a little bit longer than I thought, mm-hmm. and a little, but it's I'm learning so much in the process. But once I get my certification, which should be in a couple like a week or so. Um, I plan on taking on clients and getting, you know, everything together and making that happen and incorporating that into my, sc- my schedule with my, um, my music and um, everything else that I've got going on. But I, I want to create my clothing line brand, which is Loyalty Conquers Everything Entertainment is my label. Wow. And um, I want to, my clothing line is just going to be loyalty. And I want to do the tanks, the gym tanks, which also, also go with my music. Which, which is loyalty, Congress Everything Entertainment. And um, my boy Selvier, which is my partner. He's also an artist, which is super dope. Um, he's gonna help me push that. And he's, you know, he's gonna push his line too. And uh, it was dope because last, uh, yeah, like early last year we started selling tank tops, loyalty tanks. And he did his loyalty tank in Bosnia because he's from Bosnia. Nice. And um, those, sell, those sold pretty well. I did my basic loyalty tanks. I did some in uh, Spanish as well. But he came up with that whole concept and it was, it was really cool because people liked it. It was different and added variety to the clothing line. I love it. And uh, Selvir is actually the conduit who put us together and I'd love to have him on this show if you could help put in a good word at some point. Yeah, absolutely, man, that's my boy. Great. And that's another thing is I have a, a, a little surprise for you after the show. Okay. Um, loyalty has been my, the business I've been in for the last 20 years. And from the business side and the consumer side of, of helping to promote customer loyalty. Right. So I think the word loyalty uh, has a lot of depth to it. Um, but I think that's something that's really missing today, uh, whether it's relationships or in, in the business world. Um, even social media to an extent is uh, remaining loyal, you know, as, as a friend uh, in a relationship, a lot of the things we talked about today. So I love the fact that that's part of your brand. Absolutely. Because when you think loyalty, people nowadays, I feel like people are more self-indulged and, and more about themselves. Mm-hmm. You don't realize that you need a team. You can't do it by yourself. It's not possible. You have to have a team around you that actually believes in what you're doing and wants to be a part of it and pushes you. And um, people get so caught up in, I don't know why, just being selfish and being about themselves. And loyalty is about being loyal to the people around you that can help you be better and that you can help be better. So loyalty conquers everything entertainment is incorporated in that. And uh, the team around me is very loyal and very um, ambitious and they support me 100%. So at that point in time, that's, that's um, something that's, that, well, loyalty in general is something that's important to me. Yeah, well, it's a great message. So let's talk about social media a little bit more. Right. Um, how, how are you able to get things to go viral the way you did? Can you talk about that and, and that experience? Yes. Um, we're going to go back to my first viral video okay. that I ever did. And um, I believe the caption was how to, how to treat a woman or something along those lines. And, um, it was just something that popped into my head, and this was one of my first videos I've ever did. And I was just like, man, this is on my mind. And I was super nervous putting it online because I never talked about things like that. I'm like, man, these people might think I'm corny. <laughs> did you feel vulnerable? I felt super vulnerable. Yeah. And I was, and 
I was so scared and I was just like, I don't know if I want to post it. People are going to judge me. Being from a small town, being from New York, you know, you post certain things and it gets around quick and people are judging you. But you know what I was like, I'm just going to post it. So, you know, I posted it and when I first posted it, I'm looking and I'm, people are like, Chris, what the hell? And I'm just like, that's <laughs> how I felt. So what I wanted to post. I posted it and um, the numbers just went insane overnight. And I think I that video hit about 8 million views. And that was my first viral video that really just took off. And the responses I was getting and the love and how many people I actually reached out to. I was like, wow, like this is, you know, this is deep. And, it, and um, I just kind of continued after that. And then I looked back and I, and I reminisced on that situation and how I felt. And it boosted things not just in that, but in my career in general, because I started to think, me as a person and the person I want to become, am I going to sit here and constantly worry about what people think about me? Am I, am I going to sit here and constantly care about how people are judging me? Or am I going to care about being successful? Am I going to care about delivering a message? And I used to be one of the people, because of my anxiety, that cared so much about what people thought about me. And that became such a huge factor in my life. And it kept me stagnant and it kept me down here. And I got to a point where I said, I don't want this to affect me anymore. I want to be me and I don't care how people feel about it because this is who I am. And when I started to think like that, I started climbing mountains. And I reached a level that I've never reached in my life. And, um, it, and that was a huge factor in my life, just that, that simple video. It's phenomenal. Changed my life. So it, it just goes to show you, once you let go, you, you became free. Yes. And the message that you were trying to send went somewhere that you never could have imagined would go, right? Never. And I feel like it was destiny. I feel like I've always known I've had a bigger, pur a bigger purpose in life. And I've always known that I've had a voice. I didn't know how to utilize it. And now I feel like I understand my path. I understand my purpose in life. And I'm ready to put in the work that I need to put in to make my voice be heard on a broader spectrum. Speaking of your voice, you have a great voice. Thank you. When did you realize that, okay, I could, I think I could do this. I think I could sing. I think I could put out music that people actually listen to and right. appreciate. Um, <laughs> I, I think it was early college. I was a huge, huge Drake fan. Okay. Uh, I love Drake as I an love artist. Drake. Yeah, and he just sang, the way he sang and rap, I was just like, man, this is super dope. So I started to try to sing, and when I, I dropped a mixtape where my voice was, eh, it was okay. But, uh, you know, people, and that's another example, people were like, no, don't do this. I was like, nah, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna perfect it. Got a vocal coach. Um, perfected my vocals and took them to the next level and now I just feel a lot more confident you know I think I can sing pretty good pretty decent and but one of my biggest inspirations behind that was was the Drake era the, um some of my favorite artists would be Drake Chris Brown Trey songs I like the R&B side of things I like the pop side of things but um don't get it wrong you know I like the, the trap music too so I like the versatility and um being diverse in the sense of music because I feel like music is a way of expressing yourself. And um, I express myself in different ways because I have days when I want to hear that slow R&B music and I'm just in the car and you know I'm thinking about love and all that. Or I want to hear those country songs. Kane Brown, I'm a huge fan of him. And there's days when I want to hear trap music before I'm going to the gym. I want to hear some you know pump yeah. up music. Yeah, so uh, I love creating all those types of music, all those genres. And I love how all the influence, you know, you were able to come into your own based yeah. on that. Um, and I think that's, that's what music is, right? I mean, for centuries, you know, it's been passed down and it changes and it evolves. And, Absolutely. you know, you think and, you know, you put on Sirius and you see the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. It's just, you think, but in the moment, you don't realize it's changing, you know? Yeah. So, you know, what I see is the influence that you had, now you're, you're coming into your own and, and you are creating the change of today. And there's others doing the same thing that Absolutely. have had that same influence. So yeah. you mu it must be, uh, need to be part of, um, 
you know, that movement. You're part of a big movement. And um, where do you see this going? I want to take it to the next level. I want to be mainstream. I want to be able to open up more doors. <clears throat> um, I've, I've done all this on my own when I was younger. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I started this building on my own. I mean, obviously I have Selvier now and he's helped me significantly with everything. But when I first started music, uh, nobody believed in me. Nobody thought I'd be successful. And we're like, it's just, you know, it's just a hobby. But I was like, no, bro, you know, this isn't a hobby for me. This is something serious. And um, people didn't take it serious until they saw results. You know, it's, it, there's always those, those doubt. You know, most, most people don't believe in your dream right. until you bring it to life. And that's with anything. And that's why it's important to believe in yourself and to have a team to believe in you. Because the majority of people around you aren't going to believe. You know, they're going to just think, oh, it's not going to go anywhere. So um, I'm very competitive. I'm very ambitious, so my, my idea was I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I love and I'm going to make you guys believe it. And um, I, think, I think I'm doing a good job at that. At I do too. And when you say mainstream, are you talking a record label or are you talking more uh, Chance type style where he's that's, really... That's awesome that you know the Chance the Rapper. Well, because of my daughter, you know. I yeah. mean, we, this is the music we listen to, you know, because it's in our household. And, but I, I've, I love his message. Right. Um, and, I, and I think his message is good for young people. Mm -hmm. um, yes, he swears, you know, there's a lot of that, but, but, he, but if you go deeper and listen to those lyrics, um, and I've been, again, I've been exposed to it through, through my daughter, um, there is a, a good message there. But he stayed away from record labels, right? He, He's doing it on his own. He did it independent. Um, I'm not gonna like bash record labels, but um, when you sign to a record label, you're pretty much giving your rights to that label. You're giving your music to that label, and you're losing a, lose, uh, a high percentage of what you could be making on your own if it's possible. Chance, the rapper, was um, a very powerful rapper, and he had his own fan base. He didn't need the label. He didn't need that 20, 30 percent taken from him. Um, he was able to accumulate all these followers and create this mass growing by himself. So all that profit that he make is, makes is generally going to himself. Um, I would love to take that route. I would love to not sign to a label. I would love to do it all by myself. But uh, we'll see what yeah. we'll see what happens, I guess. And you're on that trajectory, right? You are you are starting to build that, you know, yeah. million plus base. Building that foundation. Yes. And um, I feel like 2018 is going to be a great year for me. A great year for my team. Uh, we have a lot of things in the works. Can you talk about that? Uh, April, we plan on going on tour, doing a whole tour around the country. So that's going to be huge for us. Uh, booking shows and just making things happen in that sense is going to be huge for us. And just getting our name out there on a bigger spectrum now. Because now that we have the following and we have those, those followers on Facebook and Instagram and stuff, we're able to book a show in Miami and book a show in Cali and, and uh, bring people out. And word of mouth, you know, you're bringing out more and more people. And it's just, it's just a great start. And, and, we, and we've done shows where we've, we've packed house. And, and it's, it's just a great feeling to know that that many people support you. And I always want to be able to give back and show that love. That's great. So what does your portfolio look like right now? How many songs have you written? Uh, I've got a ton of songs that I've never released. Mm -hmm. released but um, I've got a, a good amount of songs on um, iTunes. One of my biggest songs was Telly. Yes which is my single. Uh, I did an acoustic version to that as well. Uh, Playing Games was a, a single that I just released on iTunes. One of the biggest things that we accomplished, well, some of the biggest things that we accompli accomplished last year was uh, Pandora. We got a Pandora station now. Um, what does that mean? Th that was huge because I was trying to be on Pandora for the longest and all my music kept getting denied, 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 denied. Hmm. And um, I submitted Telly and it got accepted. They gave me my own station. It's really, it's hard, it's, for me, it seemed like it was just hard to get on there for an independent okay. artist. And you know, a lot of people that get on there have record labels and it's easier for them to get through the door, but for somebody that's just doing it independent. Congratulations on that. Thank you, I appreciate that. So, uh, and now like all my songs are getting streamed on there. And it's, it's helped with people downloading it and noticing my music because I'm popping up on the, the Chris Brown radio stations and the Trey Songz radio stations and their songs are coming into my station. So it's incorporating very well. So exciting. Yeah, and um, we're pretty much on every platform 
Cause just we're just trying to get through that TV door now. We want to be on the TV. In what way? Um, I would like to eventually get on the, you know, the MTVs and the, and the BETs and get into the acting side of things. I think that would be awesome. Um, that's that's a main goal of mine. I love the music, but if I can incorporate acting into it, like, kind of like what Tyrese did with Fast yes. and Furious kind of kind of deal. You know, he started singing R and B, then he got into the movies, and I feel like I have a knack for acting, and I feel like I have the talent to do it. So. I would love, love, love to get into that. Is that something you talk about? I've, I haven't heard that before. Because um, I, I haven't really st- got into it yet because okay. of everything else is just so much going on. But um, a couple of a couple of things that we have going on this year where um, I'm going to be acting in a couple videos. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that'll, that'll show a different side to me. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a natural next step for you as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, acting in music videos that I do already is kind of kind of natural at this point. Chris, when are you your happiest? When are you at your happiest time? Um, when am I at my happiest is, time? Is it singing? Is it working out? Is it... With, with my family, with, with my, the, the, my loved ones, my, my mom is uh, one of the greatest times because when I go visit my mom, you know, she'll cook for me, and you know, we'll just hang out and we'll, and we'll talk, and that, that just means a lot to me. Like, my, having my mother in my life, just having, just being able to just have that bond. Is she local? Or do you see her often? She lives in Windsor. Okay. So she's like 20 minutes away. It's nothing for a drive, but uh, she keeps me down to earth, you know. She tells me like it is, <laughs> and she, she always keeps it, keeps it honest with me, you know. She's not going to sugarcoat it. Yeah. And, and that's one thing I love about her. One of the many. Sure. Yeah. You talked early on about um, your anxiety and uh, the need to want to be alone. And uh, in some ways, I think today there's not enough of that. You know, there's there's so much interaction with technology that, especially young people, uh, don't take enough time just to be in silence to you know, to clear their own mind without, yeah. without any technology. Do you feel that's important? And if so, why? I do because we can sit there and look at a social media screen all day and watch videos, but we need that time to ourselves. Because it almost makes people, watching everybody else on, on TV and watching everybody on social media, it almost makes you want to become that person or want to live that lifestyle. And I think that's what confuses our generation, because our younger generation, because, you know, we see these guys on TV, these rappers flashing money, all this fancy stuff. That's so realistic. And you want to become that. And you forget who you are. You forget the life that you're living at that moment. And you try to become somebody that you're not. Or, on the other side of things, you become insecure with yourself because you don't have these things. You know, we see these women will look online and see all these gorgeous women and... It's like, wow, she's perfect. Is she really perfect? No, but we think she's perfect. Because she looks perfect, and we don't really know her. And every, she's getting all this love, and she's getting millions of views and millions of likes. Um, we allow that to make us insecure. And we can't do that not knowing that this person has all these issues that we'll never know because they never show those things to us. Um, we have to be happy with who we are. We have to have love for who we are and accept the life that we live. And if we want to live a different life, we have to work towards that to get to that. But we should never live through somebody else, and we should always take that time to ourselves to figure out, this is what I want to do, this is who I want to be, and this is how I'm going to get there. And we got to find our own path. Are you optimistic about the future? And not only for yourself, but for the world? Um, yeah, in, in, in a sense. What, what do you mean by that? Well, there's a lot of things happening today. You know, um, the political climate has changed. Uh, there's been a lot of racial, you know, tension over the, over the years. Um, um, I'm an optimist, so I try to look at things on the positive side. But from an artist, uh, from your perspective, you know, how do you view the world? How do you view the future? You're a millennial. You're kicking off our series here. Um, it's important, I think 
for your views to be heard, and um, I'm interested in that. I'm, I'm concerned in a sense, yes, because everything is just so, if you look at the world right now, everything is just so crazy, all the tragic incidents that we're having, but, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge, I gotta be honest, I'm just not a huge fan of Trump. I feel like he's making some terrible decisions. He just says the first, he's just, literally, sometimes when I hear him, I'm like, are you high when you're talking right now? Because <laughs> some of the things he says is like completely absurd. But I have faith. I, got, I have to have faith. I have to have faith that things are going to be, turn out for the best. But um, I think it takes positive influences. It takes figures that are going to deliver positive messages. And not just me, that's just anybody. Um, anybody that has a platform to talk, anybody that has a platform to speak, we have to deliver positive messages. We can't talk about things that aren't real or, in a sense, fraudulent because people are, because it's cool. We have to follow down a path, lead a path so that people can follow down it in the right direction and deliver that positive message and make, to make the world a better place. Yeah. Tell us about. Mrs. Curtin. Ah, Mrs. Curtin. Where would you find that one at? <laughs> was she a positive influence in your life? Yes. I love Mrs. Curtin. That was one of my teachers at Seton. Uh, as I told you, when I was in, when I was 7th, 8th grade going in Johnson City, transitioning to Seton, when I went to Seton, I was like, damn, I, I didn't want to be there. I hated it. My anxiety was crazy. And I didn't go to class at first. I was like, you know, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't, ha I didn't talk to anybody. That's the thing. I didn't want anybody to know what was going on with me. I didn't let my, my feelings go. And uh, my first day walking into school, I, I ran into this lady and, I'm, and she was like, what's your name? I'm like, Chris. She's like, Chris what? I'm like, Chris Perry. She's like, come into my office. You know, she pulled me into her office and she's like, you're gonna be going to all your classes. And if you're not in your classes, you're gonna come sit in my room. And I was like, who the hell is this lady? <laughs> Come to find out, like when my dad put me in the school, you know, he had to talk with Mrs. Curtin, and Mrs. Curtin was kind of the lady that dealt with the kids that were a little bit more on the edge. And um, I spent a lot of time, a lot of time in Mrs. Curtin's room, just kind of doing work. You uh, know, she talked to me a lot. She yelled at me a lot. <laughs> she gave she was me looking after you, right? She gave me tough love. Yeah. And Miss Curtin was a huge influence in my life because if I didn't have her, I don't honestly think that. I might not have graduated because regardless of that I had football and that I was focused with everything without her pushing me, making sure that I went to my classes, uh, being there when I was down and I don't think I would have, I would have made it. So I love that. I love that lady. And um, a while ago we went out to lunch and we just talked about everything and she's just such, such a sweet woman. She must be proud. She is proud. Uh, you know, you just made me think about it. I probably got to give her a call when I get out of here. We got to set up another date soon. She'll but, love um, that. She was like my second mom at school kind of thing. Nice. Yeah. So, Chris, this has been great. Um, I just have a couple more questions. And um, the first one is, if you think about your goals, you have a, you know, a huge future ahead of yourself. Um, what's your ultimate goal in life? <clears throat> My ultimate goal, as far as being successful, would, would love, I would just love to get into the acting after everything and just, but I want to create, like one of my favorite actors would be Denzel Washington. Because I love how when he does movies, he, he gives you a message behind it. He has such a huge impact. Um, I love that idea of being, of acting. I, I love the idea of when I get to a certain age, talk show, um, just creating the brand in a whole, but delivering messages and being able to have a talk show where I bring guests on to tell their stories and people that are coming up, artists and, and, and motivational speakers, being able to allow them on that platform and give them that platform to be successful and have their story be heard the same way that I had my story be heard. And uh, that's going to be huge and I, I just can't wait. I, I have so many plans and goals that I want to do along those lines. So 2018, I'm, I'm, it's going to be a great year. We're going to make it happen. I have no doubt, and I have all the faith in you. Thank you. So I ask every 
guest on the show this last question, and you're a little young, but I, I'm curious to, to your response, and that is, do you think about your legacy? And if so, what do you want your legacy to be? I think about my legacy all the time. I'm always trying to think a couple steps ahead. Uh, I just want to be known as just a stand-up guy, somebody that, you know, 20 years from now, a kid can look at, look at me and be like, you know, I want to be like this kid. And there's nothing wrong with that because I delivered a positive message. And I, and I, want, I want my legacy to be about being respect, doing things the right way, working hard, being ambitious, being your own self-made, creating, and just being able to create your own, your own image and not caring what people think about you and being able to be just great in your own sense and, and, and delivering that message to the world. Fantastic. Chris, I hope this is the first of many of our conversations. Yes, I will be so back. so much appreciate you coming uh, on American Real and sharing your story and let's stay in touch and thanks so much. Thank you, sir. I appreciate, appreciate it. it.